Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. Join the Patreon for these character sheets and a whole bunch more, and like and subscribe for more piggybacks next time you play. Maybe. Today, I'm the Spin Doctors, because I've got two princes, Lothric and Lorien from Dark Souls 3. Unfortunately, these princes don't adore you, they abhor you! All because you doubted them when they took a sick day from bonfire duties. Kind of a jerk move on your part, honestly. PTO requests shouldn't be requests, they should be warnings. I'm saying you should watch all of these videos at your job, pretend that you're at a bathroom break, and milk that clock for all it's worth. I'll even make this intro longer for you. How does that sound get you some more time on your break elden ring is coming out soon that should be that should be pretty fun you know if you let all the mid rolls play you'll be on break longer just saying you can also uh check out two lock and mango we've got a full dark souls 3 let's play over there that'll really milk the clock huh want to milk that clock all right let's get started We're gonna kick things off with Prince Lorien because that's how the boss fight starts. First, we need a big hungan sword that's maybe stained with dragon fire. Apparently, that's really hard to get off your sword, sort of like syrup in the dishwasher. Next, we need to put the team on our back. Literally, that means strength enough to carry your bro and a thick enough body to block some hits. He ain't heavy, he's your brother. Finally, we need to bounce all around the battlefield with mobility options to make up for our crawl of a movement speed. For stats, we'll be using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want, just keep your multi-classing minimums in mind. Strength will be number one, if someone doesn't invest in their HP before they hit the top of your castle, they deserve to die. Constitution next, not dying is the whole point of your character, part of that is good instincts, but the other part is a dump truck's worth of HP. Charisma after that, dude straight up crawls out of the darkness and makes me poop my pants every time, it actually gets worse on follow up playthroughs because I know the beatdown I'm about to get. Follow that up with intelligence, Lothric Castle does not have Wi-Fi, so you can't look up the lore on Fextra Life. Wisdom is a bit low, vision can get obscured with that helmet you're wearing, we're gonna dump dexterity though, you're not exactly moving around all that fast. Lorien is a human. He's one of very few people in the world who specifically didn't die, but that's because he's smart enough to not go die. We'll grab the Fey Touched feet, even if you don't stand on your feet, giving you plus one to a soft stat like Charisma, and one use of the Misty Step spell for a long rest to teleport 30 feet as a bonus action, and you also have one use of a first level enchantment or divination spell. Hunter's Mark is always a solid option, letting you pick a creature to deal an extra d6 of damage to with your weapon attacks, and you have advantage on checks to track them, though I don't know if you're ever going to leave your castle. You can cast both of these spells with spell slots later. If we get spell slots, who knows? Be patient, you're still getting paid if you're watching this on your bathroom break. Bump your strength and charisma with your two free points, take religion to try and understand the lore, and the noble background for history and persuasion. You're not peasant Lorian, you're Prince Lorian. We'll kick things off as a paladin, letting us grab two skills from the paladin list, like athletics and intimidation. You might say, hey, Lorian has some weak legs, he shouldn't have athletics, but consider this, how strong must his arms and core be? He's still wearing heavy armor, he has a sword the size of an outhouse and pulls himself around on the ground with one arm or scooting his tummy like a snail. That is a flex. Anyway, you get divine sense to know when celestials, fiends, or undead are in your area an amount of times per day equal to your charisma modifier, so you'll have a little security system to know when the ashen one is storming your gates. You also get lay on hands to heal a creature from a pool of hit points equal to five times your paladin level as an action. Healing is more your brother's thing, but paladin doesn't really start until level two anyway. That's because level two gives you a fighting style like great weapon fighting. Three roll ones and twos on damage die with a weapon you're wielding two-handed. Great swords are pretty great for this since they deal 2d6 which gives you even more consistent damage. You can't grab protection since you don't use a shield so use compelled duel to keep your brother safe. That forces a wisdom saving throw on a creature failing that they have disadvantage on attacks against creatures who aren't you and have to make a wisdom saving throw if they want to move more than 30 feet away from you. I know the ashen one couldn't fly up to beat your brother in phase one but what if you were fighting Mario? He could jump up there. Mario bros versus Lothric bros when death battle. Searing smite will give you a sword that's nice and hot, adding a d6 of fire damage to your next weapon attack and let you force a constitution saving throw on the creature you hit, dealing an extra d6 of fire damage to them every round if they fail until they succeed. You drop concentration or the spell ends in a minute. That could be 11 d6 from a first level spell. Of course, you could keep attacking the creature while they're cooking with divine smite. That isn't a spell, but sometimes I say it is. That's a joke. That adds 2d8 radiant damage to a weapon attack or 3d8 when you're attacking a fiend or undead. The ashen one is an undead. That means with searing smite, 
Smite and Divine Smite, you can deal 3d6 plus 3d8 plus 3 damage to them at level 2 with one attack. It's starting to make sense why you clean their absolute clock. Third level Paladins get Divine Health, making you immune to disease, but just in the game. Please wash your hands and cover your mouth when you sneeze. With your elbow, don't blow snot in your hands, you dingus. You also get to choose a Sacred Oath, and you're really popular as a prince, maybe even a glorious prince. With the Oath of Glory, you can channel divinity in one of two ways. Fearless Athlete gives you advantage on athletics and acrobatics checks, doubles the amount you can lift, push, carry, or drag, and increases your jump distance by 10 feet. Inspiring Smite will help you and your brother be harder to kill, letting you distribute 2d8 plus your paladin level in temporary HP to yourself and allies after you hit someone with the Divine Smite. You also get some free spells, and Guiding Bolt is the real reason I came here. It's basically Divine Smite with range, firing a ranged spell attack and dealing 4d6 radiant damage when it hits the target. It also gives the next person attacking the creature advantage on their attack roll, letting your brother hit them with his own Guiding Bolt, chaining together an absolute cavalcade chain of advantage-ridden strikes to really break my freaking controller! God damn! Fourth level Paladins get another ability score improvement. Bumping your dexterity would be a terrible idea, so bump your strength instead. We're looking to squish people. Fifth level Paladins get an extra attack, letting you make two attacks instead of one with your action. Remember, Hunter's Mark would pop on all of those attacks, but Searing Smite is only for one attack. Magic Weapon is also for all attacks, making a weapon magical in terms of overcoming resistances and giving it plus one to attack and damage rolls, helping you carve through any armor. Even Onion Armor, and Onion Armor has layers. That's free as a Glory Paladin, so you could also grab Warding Bond to give a creature plus one to their AC and saving throws and resistance to all damage. Of course, you'll take all the damage they take as well, but that makes sense when they're riding you, like a little horsey. Sixth level Paladins get Aura of Protection, giving your allies within 10 feet of you a bonus to their saving throws equal to your Charisma modifier, or if you put Warding Bond on your brother, your Charisma modifier plus one. Seventh level Glory Paladins get Aura of Alacrity, adding 10 feet to your movement speed and to the movement speed of creatures within five feet of you, so you can crawl faster than the Ashen One runs. For some reason, eighth level Paladins get another ability score improvement, letting you cap off your strength score to make your sword hit with the biggest hitbox possible. Oh yeah, totally unreasonable. Give me my money back, Miyazaki. Ninth level Paladins get third level spells. Haste is free from the glory list, doubling your movement speed, adding two to your AC, giving you advantage on dexterity saving throws and an extra action to dash, disengage, hide, use an object, or make another attack. I'm mostly doing this for three attacks per round, but 80 feet of crawling speed is pretty funny. It can really wear you out though. So when the spell ends, you'll have to take a round off of actions and reactions. Elemental weapon adds one to a weapon's attack rolls and a d4 of fire, cold, lightning, fire, thunder, or even fire damage if you want. This is also on every attack, but since it's concentration, you can't have this up with haste at the same time. 10th level paladins get aura of courage, making allies within 10 feet of you immune to frightening. Lothric is a little scared up on the balcony, but once you get him on your back, he is a little more aggressive. 11th level paladins get improved divine smite, adding a permanent d8 of radiant damage to all of your attacks, permanently staining your sword with dragon fire. Dragon fire is extra hot, so it becomes radiant, obviously. 12th level paladins get another ability score improvement. The main goal is just to squish the ashen one, so we're gonna grab the great weapon master feat. That'll let you take a negative five penalty to your attack roll to add 10 to the damage roll and make an attack with your bonus action after you've critically hit or dropped someone to zero HP. Paladin crits are already nasty with divine smite, and now you have the ability to follow that critical smite up with another smite, maybe even another critical one. If you roll like a god, 13th level paladins get fourth level spells, staggering smite adds 4d6 psychic damage to your next weapon attack, and you force a wisdom saving throw on the creature you hit, preventing them from taking reactions and giving them disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks. Hits from the prince can be a bit demoralizing. 14th level paladins get cleansing touch, letting you remove an effect of a spell on a creature an amount of times per day equal to your charisma modifier. No check necessary. The Ashen One doesn't have a lot of debuff options, and Lorian is fully immune to poison and toxic. That's why you don't see him use this. He just doesn't need to. 15th level paladins get glorious defense, helping you punish greed by adding your charisma modifier to the AC of a creature when they're attacked within 10 feet of you. If that makes them whiff, you get a free hit. So now anyone trying to sneak around to your booty to smack your bro is gonna get hit instead. 16th level paladins get another ability score improvement. Let's start working on your charisma because that's really the thing we need to protect the little baby Lothric. 17th level paladins can learn 5th level spells. Flame Strike is free from glory, forcing a dexterity saving throw on creatures in a 10 foot radius, 40 foot high cylinder, dealing 4d6 fire and 4d6 radiant damage for a big old kablam laser. I would say that the Ashen One should have disadvantage if you teleported behind him, but that's a personnel choice. 
choice for your DM. We're going to round this off with fighter levels because we don't need to extend our paladin aura if your whole party just rides on your back. Fighters get another fighting style, like defense to add one to your AC while you're wearing armor, making you deceptively hard to hit for a guy crawling around on the ground. I mean, you're basically voluntarily prone, but you know, that's fine. You also get second wind, letting you heal 1d10 plus your fighter level as a bonus action once per short rest so you can start healing before your brother comes down. Second level fighters get action surge, letting you make two actions in one turn once per short rest for five attacks in one round with haste up or six if one of those crits with great weapon master. That would be 90 damage just from your modifiers before accounting for 2d6 from the greatsword and a d8 from improved divine smite on every attack. That's fun. Our capstone is the third level fighter for the champion archetype, giving you improved critical so you critically hit with a 19 or a 20. That means double the doubled smites and double the bonus action actioned with your great weapon master. Now that we've hit level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, you hit like a truck and can hit like an even bigger truck when you critically hit twice as often. You're also great at supporting your family with defensive buffs, rewarding bond, and all of your auras to make sure your brother is staying alive to keep you staying alive. Finally, you're really mobile with extra speed from haste and aura of alacrity and misty step to get wherever you want to be. For weaknesses, you're pretty dependent on radiant damage, so fighting angels could be a challenge. You're also dealing with an uncapped casting modifier, so some of your lasers could be easy to avoid. Finally, you're pretty limited with ranged options. Guiding bolt is really your only one, so you could have an issue with flying foes. Thankfully, the ashen one can't fly. That means they can only die. Bars. They're no angel, after all, so squish them for questioning your decision to Ferris Bueller the rekindling. The only way you could be worse to fight is if they had to fight you twice. Let's start off with our goals for this build. First, lasers. So many lasers. So many unreasonable amounts of lasers. Next, even more annoying than lasers, is resurrection and healing magic, so we'll get that. Little brothers are very annoying. Finally, if Big Bro is going to fight for you, it would be nice if you gave him some extra oomph. For stats, we'll be using the standard point buy, not because we need to be super min-max, or at least not maxed. Set your wisdom, intelligence, and charisma to 15. Learn the lore, heal people, and convince everyone to leave you alone. Dump your strength, dexterity, and constitution down to 8. You are not the physical type. If your brother is a human, so are you. Generally, I guess. Half-elves are a thing, I suppose, but anyway, metamagic adept will be your feat. That'll give you two sorcery points you can spend on metamagic options, like quickened spell, to cast a spell that normally takes an action as a bonus action. That will help you spam lasers really hard later. Bump your intelligence and your wisdom with your two free points, grab intimidation for your skill of choice, and the sage background for arcana and history. Unlike Lorian, you actually spent time in college, a college where the professors wear giant hats and shoot lasers at you. That's Dark Souls, baby! We'll kick things off as a cleric. That's the only class that can heal after all, then it will let us grab two skills from the cleric list, like medicine and religion, to keep your brother happy in your weird church castle thing. We're going peace domain, cleric, since you don't want to fight for that light. I was gonna make you a light-based cleric for all of the lasers, but you specifically don't do the bonfire lighting thing. This will give you another skill, like insight, so you know if people are coming to your castle to kill you, spoilers, they are. You also get emboldening bond, letting a number of creatures equal to your proficiency bonus, which can include you, add a d4 to their ability checks, attack rolls, or saving throws but only one of those per turn. You also get two free spells. Heroism gives a creature immunity to frightening and temporary HP equal to your wisdom modifier at the start of their turns, making Lorian less Borean. Sanctuary protects a creature, making whoever attacks them roll a wisdom saving throw or pick another creature so you can have your brother take hits for you. For your spells of choice, Cure Wounds will heal a creature 1d8 plus your wisdom modifier as an action, pretty much the most basic healing you can get. If you need to heal a little bit faster, Healing Word heals a creature 1d4 plus your wisdom modifier as a bonus action. With a 60 foot range, you wouldn't need the range, but you could use the speed. Guiding Bolt shoots a ranged spell attack that deals 4d6 radiant damage and gives the next creature attacking the target advantage. It hasn't changed since Lorian got it, but now you can use it so Lorian can drop the big old easy hit. For cantrips, Sacred Flame forces a dexterity saving throw on a creature, dealing a d8 of radiant damage and ignoring cover, so it doesn't even matter that I was clearly behind the pillar. What the fuck? Run so god fuck! Word of Radiance forces a constitution saving throw on creatures within 5 feet of you, dealing d6 of radiant damage to those that fail if you want to shoot some energy at someone up close. Finally, Spare the Dying will stop a creature from rolling death saving throws, and not for the bad reason, for the good reason. They're stable now. Second level clerics get to channel divinity with two options. Turn Undead will force a wisdom saving throw on undead creatures, forcing them to run away if they fail, which is great for you to bully the Ashen One. Nobody makes ranged builds in Dark Souls 3. The other option is the Balm of Peace, letting you move your movement speed as an action, healing as many creatures as you want, 2d6 plus your wisdom modifier as you pass by them. I actually think Turn Undead is more in character for you. That hasn't happened since like Luigi? Remember Luigi? One of my first 10 videos was Luigi? Why? Third level clerics can learn second level spells. Warding Bond lets you give a creature plus one to their AC and saving throws. Resistance to all damage, but you take damage whenever they do. If you and your brother use this at the same time, you basically share all the damage, but with better AC and saving throws. So that's kind of nice. And it would also be nice if you casted aid, adding five extra HP to three creatures of your choice, and it's 
it's not temporary HP, it's just HP that only lasts for eight hours. But that will make you and your brother thicker, and some third person, maybe like uh, Gundyr. Lesser restoration removes an effect of a disease, blindness, deafness, paralyzation, or poisoning to stop anyone from cheesing your brother with some bamboozlery. Fourth level clerics get an ability score improvement, bump your wisdom right away, that's the most important thing, to heal more and to make your lasers harder to avoid. Fifth level clerics get to destroy undead of challenge rating one half or lower when they fail the turn undead saving throw. If somehow the Ashen One made it to the top of the tower at soul level one, they'll probably just get deleted. You can also learn third level spells like Revivify, bringing a creature back to life as long as they haven't been dead for a minute or more. Its material components can get expensive, but you're a prince, you can afford it. Spirit Shroud adds a D8 of radiant damage to attacks made within 10 feet of you or cold or necrotic, but those aren't accurate. It also slows enemies down by 10 feet, so those homing beam attacks will hit a little more accurately. Finally, Beacon of Hope gives creatures advantage on death and wisdom saving throws, and they automatically heal the maximum amount from healing spells. You get all of Lorien's HP back with one spell. Obviously, that's a max roll. Six level Peace Clerics get Protective Bond, meaning that when you've got the Emboldening Bond on some people, they can teleport 30 feet as a reaction to take damage for each other. That lets your brother not only teleport kind of at will, he can teleport just to make sure you don't get hit, which would be really annoying to fight. You also get a second channel of Divinity per short rest to keep those dang undeads away from you. Seven level clerics get fourth level spells like death ward preventing a creature from dying the first time they should in the next eight hours hitting one hp instead of zero helping you save a bit of souls on revivify components aura of purity makes creatures immune to disease resistant to poison damage and gives them advantage on saving throws against effects like blinding charming deafening frightening poisoning paralyzation and stunning for up to 10 minutes depending on your concentration even better protection against the bamboozlery eighth level clerics get another ability score improvement so you can cap off your wisdom modifier to be one of the best healers we've ever had we don't have a lot of healers you're basically competing with Mercy, Kyrie, and Katara. You also get potent spellcasting, adding your capped wisdom modifier to the damage of your cantrips, so those sacred flames are really going to be annoying. And you also have destroy undead of challenge rating one or lower, still not at all useful when the ashen one has to clear the dancer before they stomp up to your door. How are they level one? Ninth level clerics get fifth level spells. Greater restoration removes an effect of exhaustion, charming, petrification, a curse, or a limit to their HP or ability scores. It's just nice to be healthy in an apocalypse. I get it. I quit smoking in 2020 because of the pancake demi gloss. Raised Dead brings back any creature that's died in the last seven days, but also gives them some resurrection sickness. That's a negative four to ability checks, attack rolls, and saving throws. The penalty gets reduced by one every short rest. That's obviously why no matter how many times you come back to make it to phase two, if you die, you need to come back and do phase one again. Tenth level clerics get divine intervention, letting you ask the gods of the world to give you some help in some way. Your DM decides what that is. You roll a d100, and if you roll lower than your cleric level, some deity helps you out. I think your mom is kind of a god. Your dad is a dragon monster thing now. It would be really fun if after beating Lothric and Lorien, Osiris just dropped in for phase three, but obviously Miyazaki made Dark Souls 3 for the baby gamers who can't handle a challenge. 11th level clerics can learn six level spells like the spell heal, which automatically heals a creature 70 HP. It's not quite your brother's full health bar, but we'll get there. Sunbeam lets you fire off some lasers that force a constitution saving throw on creatures in a 60 foot line, dealing 68 radiant damage to those that fail and blinding them for the round, half damage and no blindness if they succeed. You can fire that huge laser every round for a minute, depending on your concentration, making a huge hazardous area to fight you and Mario in. Maybe in your home game, it's Mario and Lothric. I don't know. Your Destroy Undead also cooks undead of challenge rating two or lower. 12th level clerics get another ability score improvement, and we don't need anything, so just bump your constitution for a little bit more of HP and concentration. Those are always nice things. 13th level clerics can learn 7th level spells. Regenerate heals 4d8 plus 15 HP instantly, and 1 HP every round after that for an hour. That's some good hands-off healing. 14th level clerics can now destroy undead of challenge rating three or lower automatically which includes mummies you ever wonder why there aren't any mummies in dark souls it's because they all tried to bother lothric 15th level clerics can learn eighth level spells holy aura gives friendly creatures advantage on saving throws enemies attacking them have disadvantage on attack rolls and fiends are undead attacking your brothers have to make a constitution saving throw or they're going to be blinded by the holy light of brotherhood 16th level clerics get another ability score improvement let's keep bumping the constitution i think you have a lot of concentration spells 17th level clerics can learn ninth level spells Power Word Heal instantly brings a creature to full HP and clears any status effect on them, guaranteeing you get the most out of your massive heal. Though, actually, mass heal is much better for anyone in a party of more than two, so probably grab that. You also get Expansive Bond, sharing your brotherly love across 60 feet instead of 30. If someone teleports in to take a hit for you, they can resist that damage too. Just like your brother, we're going to start multi-classing right here at the end. First, over to Sorcerer, specifically a Holy Soli for Divine Favor, letting you add 2d4 to a failed attack roll or saving throw once per long rest. But you also get more spells and cantrips. Magic Missile is really what we're here for. Shooting three darts that deal 1d4 plus one force damage each, which is pretty terrible by the time you're total level 18.
13, but they automatically hit. So that's nice. Maybe we'll talk about that more in a second. Mage armor makes a creature's AC 13 plus the dexterity modifier when they're not wearing armor. You don't wear armor, you wear a prayer skirt. For cantrips, guidance and resistance give a creature a D4 to add to ability checks and saving throws respectively. Light will help you and your brother see in the dark with your bad human eyes and create bonfire creates a bonfire. Oh, no, no, don't take, don't take that spell. That's not a character. Never mind. Don't do it. Multi-glassing spellcasters isn't all that scary. Check page 165 of the player's handbook. Figure out how many spells you have at any given level. Second level sorcerer is what we're here for. A font of magic with two sorcery points you can use to recover spell slots and you can convert spell slots into sorcery points as well. Those are things you can use on quickened spell to cast two sacred flames per round, which now deal 4d8 plus 5 radiant damage each. Our capstone will be the 18th level of cleric for one extra channel of divinity and more bullying of the ashen ones who are just trying to mess up your truancy. Now that we've hit level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, healing is really good and you can bring people back from the dead. You're also pumping out some serious radiant damage, blasting lasers every which way. Here's a fun little combo. Cast Spirit Shroud at the 9th level. That will make all your hits within 10 feet of you deal 4d8 extra radiant damage. Then, cast Magic Missile at the 8th level to deal 10d4 plus 10 force damage plus 40d8 radiant damage or around 190 damage with median rolls on the damage that's guaranteed to hit. Finally, you're the best piggybacker with plenty of support for your brother while you ride on his back thanks to your protective bonds. For weaknesses, you have no physicality whatsoever. If your party doesn't have someone who lifts to drag you around, that could be an issue. You're also missing the Cleric Capstone, which is pretty busted instead of having more quickened cantrips. That's just not as good. Finally, bringing people back from the dead is expensive. Thankfully, you have the budget of Lothric Royalty, and Lorien hits hard enough to take out the Ashen One before you even get in the fight. If you want to be the tank that deals damage, you're set. If you want to ride on the tank's back and prevent them from staying dead, do it. Just make sure you know which way the wind is blowing. A true gale could blow you away. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, subscribe for more. We're making double videos every day this month. Join the Patreon for this sheet and a whole bunch more, and sub to Tulak and Mango to watch us play some Dark Souls 3.